Airstrikes on Gaza, violence in the streets of Jerusalem, and Israeli police storming Al-Aqsa Mosque. The last weeks in Jerusalem have been filled with unrest as Palestinians protest against the Israeli occupation and Israel's plans to evict families from the residential neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Some people even speak of a third intifada. So what exactly is going on that the Western corporate media is not telling you? Let's break it down. I'm Richard Medhurst and you're watching The Communique. For several weeks, Palestinians have been protesting in Jerusalem and now all across Palestine as scores have been injured by Israeli police and forces who have sought to crush any resistance. Protests began at the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem after Israel imposed restrictions on Palestinians at the start of the holy month of Ramadan. The protests were further amplified when simultaneously Israeli courts announced they would be evicting Palestinian families living in the residential neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem to make way for Jewish settlers. Israel has been illegally occupying Jerusalem since the 1967 war. Its courts are legal and have no say. However, Israel enforces its court's decisions through the use of its military forces and police who illegally occupy Jerusalem and impose Israeli rule of law. The United Nations and the international community at large consider the holy city of Jerusalem to be corpus separatum or separate body meaning an international entity that does not belong to just any one country, given its religious and historical importance, of course. There have been numerous United Nations Security Council resolutions demanding that Israel withdraw from the occupied territories, not just in Jerusalem, but in the West Bank and the Syrian Golan Heights. Israel illegally annexed Jerusalem in July of 1980 and declared Jerusalem its capital. This was subsequently condemned by the UN and declared null and void. Nonetheless, Israel continues to illegally occupy these territories and is subsidized by the United States to the tune of $3.8 billion a year in military aid, as well as receiving the full political backing of Western countries. The Palestinian families living in Sheikh Jarrah, who've been told to leave their homes by the illegal Israeli courts, have been living there since the 1950s. The sad irony is that these families came to Jerusalem in the first place as refugees after being kicked out of their original homes by Zionist militias in the 1948 war. Now Zionists are telling them again to leave their homes, which are rightfully theirs under an agreement with Jordan, which was cut short when Israel invaded in 1967. So in essence, Palestinians who were kicked out of their homes already once by Israelis are now facing the possibility of being kicked out again once more by Israelis. On Monday, May the 10th, 2021, the Israeli Supreme Court was set to rule on the issue of eviction in Sheikh Jarrah but this ruling was abruptly postponed, perhaps in large part because of the protests. Now joining me from Sheikh Jarrah to discuss more is Zakaria Odeh, coordinator of the Civic Coalition for Palestinian Rights in Jerusalem. So Zakaria, can you in your own words tell us as an activist, as a coordinator, you know, what the protests are about and how the situation escalated? What is happening in Sheikh Jarrah? Uh, Israeli police and security they start putting restriction on Palestinians in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem, and outside the Damascus Gate, you know, which is where is like the square of Jerusalem, the main square of Jerusalem, which is outside the Damascus Gate. They start preventing the Palestinians from being there, from sitting there. You know, sometimes, you know, this place is where people, they go sometimes in Ramadan to have their own breakfast. There was a big protest which expanded in all Jerusalem, not only on the Damascus Gate, in the old city, on other streets on Jerusalem, in support of the people who are in the, in the square of the Damascus Gate. Then this was then connected, it's connected with the case of Sheikh Jarrah. You know, Sheikh Jarrah, it's a neighborhood where the Palestinian families have been living there since 1956. And two Israeli settler group, they have been trying to evict them, to force, displace them from their homes. You know, this is, this is a community of 73 households. Since the order of this eviction, which started like a few weeks ago, so the protest has 
started in connection with the protest which was going on in Damascus Gate. So people, they come nearly every day to join the protest to support our people in Sheikh Jarrah and to protest against their eviction by the Israeli government and by the Israeli uh, police. What led to an escalation in the situation there? So, and this was escalated as well because the police escalated, the police, the special security forces, they were harassing the people, they were harassing the youth, they were trying to stop to stop the youth and arresting and detaining, detaining the youth as well. Tension was increasing, protests were increasing in different neighborhoods in Jerusalem, not only outside Damascus Gate, in the old city, Silwan, al Mount of Olive, uh, Sheikh Jarrah. So they have been deploying a lot of police, a lot of special forces, a lot of uh, security forces in the neighborhood. And they have been really harassing the people every day. They have been really using the horses to attack the youth and the people who are there by the horses. They have been using the scum water. You know, it's a very, very, very bad water. They use it every day with these cars to spread all the homes around in the area. Can you imagine? Zakaria, you know, the way the Western media reports on this, they, they'll t constantly talk about Hamas firing rockets, but uh, they, they don't actually talk about the violence that Israel inflicts on Palestinians. Could you tell us more about that? Could you tell us about how it actually is? So the, the West or the media, they don't talk about this because, because this is violence. This is really violence. It's not, yani, yani, they talk only the concern when there are rockets coming from Gaza, but they don't talk about the daily, it's a daily violence, it's a daily harassment by the police, by the special forces, by the security, by the army everywhere in the West Bank, in the West Bank as well. It's a daily life for us, you know, through the checkpoint, the closure, uh, arrest, detention, it's every day. Unfortunately, this is for the West. They don't talk about that. They, they don't talk about this issue, which is like the daily life of our people everywhere in Jerusalem. So, you know, so it's very important when we talk about what's going on the protest. It's not really only connected that there are 15, 20 family will be evicted or it is a battle on the stairs of Damascus Gate because they start calling it the battle on who is who, uh, who control the square of Damascus Gate. No, this is, I mean, what's going, this is only like the sparking issue, the sparking for all these, uh, it's like we call it maybe uh, mini intifada or habba, we call it, you know, in June, it will be 54 years of Israeli occupation. It is the result of accumulation of this continuous, very systematic policy, land control, building settlement, expansion of settlement, restriction on building for Palestinians. What makes this uprising different from others? And how long do you expect it to last? How long do you expect it to go on for? These are popular resistance and protest that started by and initiated by the people who are under the harassment, under the suppression, under the uh, protection, under the uh, oppression. So it's not organized by political parties or groups, no. It is spontaneous started. You know, I told you that the, the first battle was about who control the stairs of, she of Damascus Gate. Yani, can you imagine? And it escalated, it developed, it became, and it started with like tens of young people, then hundreds, then thousands every day. And then they managed, they succeeded to force the police to leave the area, to remove the barriers. The issue of Jerusalem started with the families. Then the people joined them from Jerusalem every day. Then it spread to the other neighborhood of Jerusalem. You know, the escalation of Israeli police harassment and the settlers led that it unite the, all the Palestinians to be united, to resist, 
and to protest everywhere, everywhere. You know, there are demonstrations yesterday, today, the day before yesterday in most of the cities in the West Bank. In Gaza is the uprising, if we, I don't know if we can call it uprising, it's the protest, which is in, in all the neighborhood of Jerusalem, in all the different area of the West Bank, and now it's everywhere in Palestine. And with what's happening as well from Gaza, with Gaza as well, it's all of it connected to each other's. We'll be right back after this short break. As protests grew larger in occupied Palestine, with crowds forming outside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Israeli police stormed the mosque on May 10th, 2021. They fired tear gas inside the mosque, they threw stun grenades and shot at people with rubber-coated metal bullets. The horrifying scenes were all caught on video through mobile phones with people screaming and shouting in panic inside the mosque. It's important to understand that even if this had happened in another mosque, it would be equally as barbaric. However, Al-Aqsa Mosque, or the Dome of the Rock, is the third holiest site in Islam. It is extraordinary religious importance for Muslims and is one of the reasons why Jerusalem itself is revered and held in such high regard in Islam. The fact that the Israelis, who are already illegally occupying Jerusalem, decided to walk into this mosque, or barge into it rather, with armed police, and to desecrate such a holy place during the holy month of Ramadan, speaks volumes. This is just further proof how the brutal Zionist regime is towards Palestinians, how little it respects Palestinians, of all faiths, but especially Muslims. The raid by Israeli border police left 90 people wounded inside the mosque and 200 in total that day. If that wasn't shocking enough, later that day, a tree caught fire just outside Al-Aqsa Mosque. Israelis were then seen filming themselves dancing and celebrating as flames bellowed out from just outside the third holiest site in Islam. That same day, on May 10th, Israelis celebrated their so-called Jerusalem Day. Not to be confused with Qudus Day, which has the same name, but is a different holiday that was created by Iran following the Islamic Revolution in 1979. One of the pillars of Iran's Islamic Revolution is support for the Palestinian cause and the liberation of Palestine and Jerusalem. Quds Day is meant to show solidarity with Palestinians and calls for the liberation of occupied Palestine and the holy city of Jerusalem. On the other hand, Israel's so-called Jerusalem Day celebration marks the capture of Jerusalem in 1967 by Israeli forces. The irony is that the Israeli lobby goes around the world, convincing other countries to ban Iran's Quds Day under the pretext of so-called anti-Semitism. Yet Israel's Jerusalem Day celebrates the capture of Jerusalem and subsequent illegal occupation, illegal annexation, and of course all of the horrific ethnic cleansing, the killing, and the oppression that has followed ever since. Just like the shooting of Iyad Halak in 2020, or simply the very same Sheikh Jarrah evictions that Israel is trying to force upon Palestinians now. Iran shows support to the oppressed Palestinians. Meanwhile, Israel celebrates the start of its oppression against Palestinians. It celebrates the illegal military occupation that began in 1967. Now, shortly after the events that happened at Al-Aqsa Mosque, Israel bombed Gaza, killing Palestinians, among them children. Israel also bombed at Salah School the following day and two residential buildings, causing them to collapse entirely into rubble. The death toll is now over 35. For weeks, Israelis have been marching through the streets of Jerusalem chanting slogans like death to Arabs. They've been caught on video openly damaging or destroying Palestinian owned shops and carrying firearms with them. And they of course have the full protection of the Israeli police and complete immunity from arrest and prosecution. Israeli police simply let them vandalize and undertake what is very clearly a pogrom in broad daylight. And meanwhile, the international community says nothing, and the media refers to what's happening as clashes. The Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated places on the planet. It has been under siege from Egypt and Israel since 2007. Israel has previously decimated Gaza several times, the most recent aerial bombardment and ground invasions being their so-called Operation Cast Lead in 2009 and Operation Protective Edge in 2014. Israel bans everything that goes into Gaza and has banned construction materials, leaving Palestinians to live in rubble, literally rubble, as they are unable to rebuild their destroyed homes. Asked about the airstrikes on May 10th, which left nine Palestinian children dead, 
Ned Price, the spokesperson for the U.S. State Department, refused to condemn the Israeli aggression. Joining me is the Palestinian ambassador to Austria and permanent observer at the United Nations, Mr. Salah Abdel Shafi. It's great to have you on the program, Your Excellency. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. So, Your Excellency, uh, Israel is forcing several families to leave their homes. It's evicting them, uh, specifically in Sheikh Jarrah, in occupied East Jerusalem. You know, these families have, have lived there for uh, generations, and yet the Israelis want uh, them to leave and to give these homes to Jewish settlers. I mean, this issue seems to be receiving barely any media coverage. Are you concerned by the lack of condemnation from other countries and the international community at large? No, ab absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, there is clearly a double standards here. Uh, I mean, uh, beside of what is happening in, uh, in Jerusalem, ethnic cleansing, uh, eviction of people from their homes that they've been living in for uh, generations. Uh, let me give you a recent uh, example. You know, uh, the organization uh, Human Rights Watch just issued recently a very detailed report uh, describing Israel as an apartheid uh, system. Now, usually, uh, Western media and Western politicians uh, would love to uh, quote uh, reports of Human Rights Watch when they talk about Egypt or Iran or Turkey. Uh, but when it comes to Israel, unfortunately, uh, we haven't heard anything. Uh, take, for example, the Austrian media here, nothing or we haven't seen any or heard any comment from uh, major uh, European uh, politicians. Uh, we heard even a critique to this uh, report. So again, this shows this double standard uh, policy. But again, we have to use all international law tools that are at our disposal, one of them, is the International Criminal uh, Court. And we have to challenge the Western world and say, uh, uh, you always defended the International Criminal Court. And now we have clear cases that Palestine, the state of Palestine presented to the, uh, to the court. The least that we expect from those who claim to be democratic countries is to show some respect to the International Criminal Court to show us uh, some respect to reports by credible human rights uh, organizations. During the last weeks, we've seen extremely unsettling images and footage coming out of Jerusalem, uh, particularly Israelis chanting death to Arabs and openly beating Palestinians in the street. You know, once again, how do you feel by the, the lack of response from the international community? And I mean, how do you react to the mainstream media calling these uh, events, quote unquote, clashes? instead of uh, pogroms or violence against Palestinians? You see, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, the international uh, community in general, there are, of course, exceptions, uh, deals with Israel as if it is a country above the law. Uh, that is why we, we see really, we don't see condemnations of racist, uh, Jewish Israeli attacks on uh, on Palestinians, uh, uh, you know the, the the likes we've seen recently in uh, Jerusalem, but we've been seeing this for more than fifty years under uh, under occupation. Again, I think uh, the 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 cause of Palestine uh, poses a major challenge to uh, Western democracies because the cause of Palestine, in addition of being a political uh, issue, it's an issue about international law. It's about international humanitarian law. It's about respecting uh, human rights of Palestinians. Uh, and that's why these are the values that the West claims that uh, uh, their policies is guided by these uh, values. That's why we are asking why do they stop criticizing when it comes to Israel? Is Israel a, a state above uh, the law? Uh, are the standards that are applicable universally to all countries are not applicable to, uh, to Israel? Uh, again, I think 
uh, uh, we, we don't need, we know that this is a long-term process that we need to work with uh, public opinion in these uh, countries, uh, with the civil society organization, we do know and we feel that uh, the Palestinian cause enjoys a lot of support, uh, popular support in, uh, in Europe and, and worldwide. Uh, However, this popular support should be uh, uh, ultimately reflected in the policies of, uh, yes. of governments. So, I mean, given all these tensions that are uh, taking place in Jerusalem recently, you know, I've seen uh, various media outlets moving to describe them as uh, an intifada. Do you think that's an accurate term to describe what's going on, or is that perhaps a bit too, uh, a bit too loaded? You see, it's, it's really difficult to, to, at this stage, to speak about intifada, because the concept of intifada is a much wider, is, 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 a, is a popular movement that is involving each and every corner of uh, uh, the occupied Palestinian uh, territories. Uh, but however, it could be because the centrality of the question of Jerusalem, the sensitivity of the issue of Jerusalem, politically, re religiously, it might trigger a much wider uh, reaction and uh, comes to a third to a third intifada your excellency ambassador abdel shafi it's great speaking with you and having you on the program thank you very much thank you bye bye various media outlets politicians and people on social media continue to pretend that the palestinian issue is a complicated issue this is not a complicated issue palestine has been under illegal occupation since 1948 by Zionist settlers who are ethnically cleansing Palestine to make way for more Jewish settlers. People think that the current situation in Sheikh Jarrah is also complicated or unique. It is not unique. It is not new. How do they think that Israel came into existence? Since 1948, millions of Palestinians have been kicked out of their homes and made into refugees both within Palestine and without, and all of them rendered stateless. Millions of Palestinians are still living daily under Israeli military occupation and Zionist oppression, where they are treated like third-class citizens and shot, killed, and bombed on their own land, while the whole world idly stands by and does nothing. This is a disgrace upon everyone who watches what is happening there and says nothing. The Palestinian issue is not complex when someone has rocks and the other has nuclear warheads, along with the full backing of the West. This is not an equal fight or a level playing field. This is a bloodbath. This is an occupation. So to look at this situation and pretend that one can be neutral or impartial is completely, utterly absurd. You are either on the side of the oppressed, of the Palestinians, or you are on the side of the oppressors, the Israelis. It is that simple and always has been. When the Israelis burst into the Aqsa Mosque of all places, while people are praying and desecrated during the holy month of Ramadan, no less, this is such an extraordinary, grave act of disrespect. It's truly hard to put into words how despicable and grotesque this behavior is. I mean, it, it would be disgraceful to do that in any mosque regardless, but to do that during Ramadan at one of the holiest sites in Islam exposes the level of contempt and disregard the Israelis harbor for the Palestinians and the way that they treat them. It seems there's no line that the Israelis won't cross. Their animosity towards Palestinians knows no bounds. It is outrageous what Israel is able to get away with. How do they dare to evict Palestinians on Palestinian land and render them homeless and the world does nothing? How do they dare to storm Al-Aqsa Mosque and the world says nothing? How do they dare to kill children and the world says nothing? How do they openly chant death to Arabs and the world says nothing? This is beyond despicable. This is evil. The Israeli regime is a genocidal entity. It has zero legitimacy and is nothing more than a brutal military occupation created and subsidized by the West. Its racist apartheid behavior will be recorded for history, for all to see when future generations, and they will look back on this period in time and they will wonder how this was ever allowed to happen to Palestinian people. But let us make one thing clear. Despite these Israeli attacks, despite the occupation year in and year out, despite the animosity of the West, and the indifference of the rest. Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. This is only a matter of time. The resistance and Muqawame will prevail. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Richard Medhurst and this is The Communique.